Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Uh, today I would like to solve a little bit more difficult problems, just a little bit, um, related to superposition of the forces. It's the series of the problems called Problems 2. It's part of the Physics 14th uh, on unizor.com. That's the website um, where this course is presented. Uh, on the same side, there is a, a prerequisite course, which is called Math for Teens, um, which is a relatively comprehensive course of mathematics for high school level students. Uh, and I do recommend you to watch this lecture and every other lecture actually from um, Unizor.com rather than from YouTube or any other um, source, because every lecture on the, uh, on the Unizor.com has uh, very detailed notes. Um, it has exams for those who would like to take them and it also has certain educational functionality if you would like to study under supervision of the parent or teacher or a flipped classroom or something. Okay, so the problems. Problem number one. You have an incline, a slope, with a block on the top. Well, this is basically a pulley. There is a little wheel which basically rotating without friction, obviously. Now, here we have one uh, point object with mass M1. Then there is a thread around the pulley. It goes down and this is M2. So this is a vertical line. This is an incline and there is an angle, let's say alpha. Now, what's interesting is that, well, let's just consider that M2 is greater than M1, which means that my um, thread moving this way down. Now, obviously, it's all happening on Earth, so the weight is equal to mass times acceleration of the free falling, which is 9.8 meters per second square. All right, so what's interesting is that as my combination of these two masses is moving around the pulley, it exerts certain pressure on the pulley. But I need to know the value of this pressure. Well, let's just think about it from this way. First, we have to analyze the forces which are acting. Now, obviously, we have the weight. Also, since this is an incline, there is a, a pressure which this object exerts on the incline and the reaction force back. So these are two forces, the weight, and there is a reaction force. Is that it? Obviously not, because if these two forces are the only forces which are acting, obviously the uh, mass will go downhill. It goes uphill because there is a tension tension, which is a result of this guy going down and it pulls the thread. Thread we are considering to be non-stretchable, um, so there is no friction, no stretching. So there is a tension on this particular thread, which basically pulls uh, this particular object upwards. And obviously there should be the balance here. So this is the resultant of these two forces. This is R1, this is W1, this is weight, this is reaction from the incline, and their resultant is this way. And obviously the tension should go uh, along the same line, along the, the thread basically, because our object is moving that way, right? Now, 
what kind of uh, forces are acting on this guy? Again, it's weight, W2, and again the tension. Tension just slows it down. Basically, it still goes up, but the tension slows it down. Now, so what we have right now is these tension forces, they are the same because it's the same thread, right? And their um, resultant, one is go going this way, another is going that way, so the resultant would be going upwards. Now, obviously, there should be some kind of a uh, force, which is the pressure, which the thread exerts on the pulling, pulley on, on the support mechanism here, um, which basically keeps the pulley uh, I intact, right? So the combination of these two forces and this pulley is zero, and that's why we have this pulley standing basically on the same place without um, without moving. And this is the pressure which we would like actually to find out. Well, obviously, it's supposed to be related to these two forces, the tensions, right? So unless we find the tension, we cannot find the pressure on the, on the pulley. All right, so let's start with the tension. What can we say about this particular problem? Well, um, now this is angle alpha, so this is angle alpha, right? Because it's too perpendicular to these two which means we can define this force, let's call it F1, because it's the first object, right? So F1 is equal to the W1 times uh, sine of alpha, or M1 G sine alpha. Okay, got that. Now, what can we say um, about moving of these two things? The linear moving uh, along this incline or this downward, uh, these movements are supposed to have certain acceleration which is exactly the same because they are connected by the same thread. So this going this way and this going this way, they're supposed to be um, uh, uh, movements with exactly the same uh, acceleration, speed and acceleration. So what's the acceleration using the second law of Newton of this guy? Well, acceleration, uh, let's call it A, it's equal to uh, T minus F1, right? Because T goes along the movement and F1 goes against the movement and that should be divided by m1, the mass. So that's the acceleration of this guy. Now this guy has acceleration of also the same a. It would be w2 down along minus t goes up prevents divided by m2. Now, they should be equal to each other, and that's how we will resolve it for T, right? So, um, let's write it down here. Um, T minus F1, well, I can actually substitute instead of F1, I can substitute the whole value. M1G sine A divided by M1 equals 2. Uh, W2 is M2G minus T divided by M2. So we have to resolve it for T and that's our first step to find out uh, the pressure. Alright, so obviously we have to multiply by M1, M2, so we will have T times M2 minus m1 m2 g sine alpha equals m1 m2 uh, g minus m1 t 
T goes this way, G goes that way, so we will have T times M1 plus M2 equals um, M1, M2, G, 1 plus sine alpha. Am I right? Hope I'm right. Okay, so we found T. Now, how can I find the pressure if I have the T? Well, basically, if you have these two forces, let's call it, I don't know how, T, this is from this one, so it's T2, and this is from T1. These are continuation of these, but they are the same actually, so I don't have to really have an index, since it's all the same thread. So I have this particular story. This is T, this is T. Now, what's the angle between them? This angle is, um, this is the right triangle, so it's the same as this one, which is pi over two minus alpha, right? And I have to find a force which is basically equivalent to them, which means it should be on the bisector, right? So the combination of these two is, well, I can find this piece. This is the rhombus, by the way, right? Because these two are the same and it's parallelogram. So um, I have half of this angle, which is pi over four minus alpha divided by two. I know this T, so I can find this one. It's this times cosine. So it's T times cosine of P over 4 minus, that's the half. And if I will multiply by 2, it will be the whole line, right? Because I found only the half of it. From this times cosine of this angle, it's half of the, uh, of, of the resultant. Okay. So that's the answer. And it corresponds to whatever I just said, because right now uh, I can say that this is equal to T is this divided by this sum, so it's M1, M2, G, 1 plus sine alpha divided by M1 plus M2, this one, and times cosine of pi over 4 minus alpha over 2. That's the answer. So that's the pressure which is, uh, 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 which is applied by the whole system of these um, objects and, and pulley and, and all this. The pressure applied on the base of the pulley, basically. All right. I scratched my M. Okay, next. Next is um, you have an object on the thread. I have an angle, phi, and the length of the thread. And now this object I am basically launching to do the circular movement. So it goes this way. So in the horizontal plane, this thing is making a circular trajectory. Now what do I have to find out? I have to find out if I have some time t, I would like to find number of rotations per time t. Okay. Now, again, let's see what kind of forces are acting. Obviously, this is the force, which is W1. Well, W actually, have only one object, which is Mg. And I have, obviously, a tension here. And also, I had a force which initial uh, push around, around the circle. 
um, it's no longer participating basically in, in other um, in other movements. So as long as my speed is constant, it just continues indefinitely circulating, considering there is no friction or uh, etc. Right. So there are so this force, which is along the trajectory, which was in the very beginning to basically start the movement, is no longer participating because it's no longer applied. It was just initial push and that's it. So there is no such force anymore. There are only two forces, down and along the uh, thread, the, the tension. Now, but since my object is moving uh, in a circle, obviously there's supposed to be some kind of force which keeps it on the, on the circle, right? And obviously this is the force which is the combination of these two, right? So this is the resultant force and this is the centripetal force which keeps it on the orbit. Now we know that the um, uh, speed is equal to, uh, the force is equal to mass uh, linear speed divided by r or mass r omega divided uh, multiplied by r omega squared. So this is angular speed, this is linear speed. Well let's concentrate on, on this one. So this is the force which is the resultant of these two forces. Now, if this is phi, this is phi, and this is phi, now the weight I know, well I don't know the, the, the mass, but I probably don't need it. Um, so how can I find this one? Well, um, if this divided by this is equal to tangent, so it's the weight multiplied by tangent equals to my force, let's call it F, which keeps it tangent of what? Tangent of phi. This is the force which keeps it on the trajectory, which is supposed to be this one. Oh, by the way, I didn't know the R. R obviously is calculated from L. Uh, so R is equal to L times sine of phi, right? L times sine of phi times mass times omega squared, right? So, um, and the weight is equal to mg, so I can put mg here. Now, what we have from here is, basically all we need is omega, because this angular um, uh, speed will obviously uh, allow us to define how many uh, rotations per, per unit of time we have. So um, we obviously can cancel t, I will have g is equal to L times sine of phi times omega square. So omega is equal to square root of g divided by L sine of phi. Okay, we've got omega. So this is angular speed, which is number of radians per, let's say, second, right? Number of radians per second. What we need is number of um, full rotations per time t. Well, if this is number of radians per second, then within the time period t, we will make number of radians would be obviously t times greater, which is t times square root of g over L sine phi. So that's number of radians. Now if you would like to change it to a number of rotations, and each rotation is 2 pi radians, I have to divide it by 2 pi. And this is my answer. This is number of rotations per uh, unit of time t. Rather, per t units of time. I didn't say it correctly. During the time t. Okay, next. Next is um, the following. So you have a wedge. This is phi and this is phi. 
wages going down. Now here are two similar masses, point masses, point objects obviously, M and M. Now the wage has mass M. Now it's all on the table, there is no friction, so as wage goes down it pushes aside both objects, right? Now, my task is to find out the acceleration these two objects will be pushed aside, right? All right, so again, what we start with, obviously, the forces. Now, what kind of forces actually are involved here? Well, the weight here and weight here are insignificant because they are completely uh, balanced by the um, reaction of the, uh, of the table. So that's not important. So what is important is, let me just scratch this. So we know that this is angle phi and phi. What is important is the reaction from this particular movement. So it's always perpendicular. Now these are point objects, right? So the reaction will be perpendicular to the sides of the wedge. Let's call it N. And here and N there. So the uh, wedge goes down and it pushes with certain force our blocks aside and the blocks these two blocks are uh, reacting by uh, these forces back to the to, to the wedge now the wedge goes down let's say with acceleration aw and these two are going left and right corresponding with acceleration A. Now, how can I transform these forces into the forces which are acting along the direction of the movement? Now, direction of the movement of, of the wedge is down, direction of the movement of these is horizontal, left and right. So, I have to convert the all the forces into the forces um, which are parallel to these two directions now in case of the wedge in case of the wedge i have the weight it goes down and it's equal to mg right and i have the force which is perpendicular perpendicular to this one and perpendicular to this one now, I would like to convert this force into horizontal and vertical uh, uh, components. Now, horizontally they will act against each other because they will act along this line here and here. Vertically, they will go up here and up here. So, I would like to find out these two because they are acting opposite to my weight. Right? So, um, let me just do a bigger picture and you will see, okay, this is my force and I need to know the vertical component and horizontal component. So this is my vertical component. Now this is angle phi. So uh, this is angle phi, right? because this is perpendicular to this and this is perpendicular to this. So if I have this, which is uh, n, unknown, obviously, then the vertical is equal to n times sine of phi. And I have from another side exactly the same thing. So they're both acting that way and they're acting with a minus sign because they're going directed upwards and the weight goes down. 
so mg. That's my total force acting vertically on this particular guy. And, there, and, and that's why the acceleration is equal to this. This is my acceleration AW. Now, let's talk about this guy. Now, this is the same N by absolute value, just differently directed. Now, uh, I need to know its horizontal component. So again, let me just do it a little bit bigger. This is my N. This is my big block. I need this component. This one. So, now this is perpendicular to this. And this one is perpendicular to this. So this is phi. So it's n times cosine. Okay. So my object has n times cosine phi as the force and divided by m is acceleration. That's different acceleration obviously. Now, how many unknowns we have? n is unknown, a is unknown, a w is unknown. So we have three unknowns with only two equations. Not good, right? But let's consider it this way. What if you have this wedge and in the beginning and in the beginning, the point where it actually touches of this block is here, in the, in the very corner. Then the wedge goes down, and this thing is sliding to the right. As the wedge goes all the way down, this thing will move to the right by this piece, right? So whenever wedge goes by this piece down, my block will be moved to the right by this piece. So their ratio as it is actually the ratio of the displacement and ratio of the velocity and the ratio of um, accelerations, obviously, because they're all proportional. So if the, if, if the uh, movement down uh, is proportional to the movement to the right, then acceleration will be also proportional. So that's how I can establish my third one. So how do they are related? If this is phi, right, then this is acceleration W would be to acceleration no, sorry this will be acceleration and this will be acceleration W this is tangent of phi right now these are three uh, linear equations with three different uh, unknowns and uh, we need to know the A, which is actually very easy because, again, these are linear equations. And the, uh, the result is uh, in my notes, and I can give you the result here. A is equal to uh, G tangent phi divided by 1 plus 2m over m times tangent square phi. So this is basically easy uh, exercise on, on system of linear equations. Uh, from here you get uh, n, you substitute n into this, uh, and you will have only a and a w, and, uh, and then from this you can get a w and substitute the result, and that would be the solution. Very easy. So I'm skipping all these technicalities, they are trivial. Notes to this lecture have, uh, have a little bit more details of this trivial calculations. We don't want to stick on it. Okay. And the last problem is the following. Let's imagine the person who would like to make a long jump. And uh, it's not exactly the way how a long jump is made, but this is a good kind of a physical problem which is related to this. So let's consider him accelerating to a certain um, speed. And at this point, he jumps up. So what happens? Well, while he is jumping up and then falls down, he continues this horizontal speed, and that would be the length where he lands, right? 
So, my purpose is to find out the lengths if I know uh, that he was accelerating during time t with acceleration zero from zero to some kind of a v some kind of a, uh, a speed and then he jumps up and I know the height so by doing by, by knowing the height and these parameters the time and acceleration I would like to find out how long he will jump well look at it this way first of all let's uh, find out the v. v is equal to a t, right? During the time t with acceleration a from uh, from velocity equal to zero, that's my maximum velocity, and this is the the, the velocity or, or a speed actually because it's one dimensional, as as he would fly forward during his um, jump up, right? Now. So all we need to know, if we know the horizontal speed, we have to know the, uh, the time during which it happens. So the time is, as he jumps up, I, I know the h. So from h I have to find the time. Well, that's actually easy, because if he goes up first, uh, it means he is pushing himself with certain vertical velocity, right? And then, during the time it goes up, let's say it's time t vertical, no, it's better to say t up. What is his um, uh, parameters? As he goes up, he has a negative acceleration of the free falling, which is g, and at the very top his velocity is zero, right? So if I will uh, subtract from the initial speed as he goes up this I will have zero right that was the initial speed at the end of the time period speed is zero so basically that's what it is so V vertical is equal to G times T up now um, how about going down? Down you go from the place where your initial speed is zero, your initial acceleration uh, uh, is basically only, speed actually is only horizontal, but then you go down with acceleration g. So it's um, the h would be equal to uh, g t, uh, sorry, Yes, acceleration and speed divided by 2, right? That's the formula. Because the initial speed is equal to 0. It's only horizontal, so vertical speed is 0. So this is my uh, going down. So this is down. Now, um, considering my uh, time to go up uh, time to go up should be equal to time to go down right so basically if I'm calculating only this or I can actually prove it I guess because the same h is equal to v vertical times t up minus g t up squared divided by 2 minus because g is slowing me down right this so my initial uh, speed up um, times the time that's my formula for uh, uh, uniform acceleration and, and acceleration is equal to g right um, uh, so that's basically um, two things where I can find out my t up and t down they are supposed to be equal and um, 
uh, and from this we can say that v is equal to gt up right and uh, because v is the beginning speed zero is the end of the speed so v vertical minus gt up should be equal to zero from which we de derive this which means that uh, in this particular case in this particular case um, we have h is equal to g t square g t times t minus g t square this is up up divided by 2 which is g t square up divided by 2 as you see it's exactly the same as t down right so that's that's the proof basically that Whatever the time you need to go up is exactly the same the time to go down. And from here, obviously, you can find time if you know the h. Time is t up plus t down, but they are exactly the same, so you can double the time uh, up. So the time of the, the entire up and down would be equal to 2 times... Uh, 2h divided by g square root 2h divided by g it's lowercase h so my time is known my speed horizontal speed is known so their product which is 2at square root of 2h divided by g is the length of the long jump. That's it. So, what you have to do now, and I strongly recommend you to do it, go to the website, go to this particular uh, problems number 2 in uh, uh, superposition of the forces. This is how you go. You go from, um, from the website, you have a, a physics for for teens, then you go to mechanics. From mechanics, you go to um, superposition of forces, <coughs> and there you have the problem problems two lecture. Now the notes contain all these problems and answers. So do it yourself. Try to solve all these problems. Check against the answers, and uh, that would be a great exercise if you can do everything just by yourself. All right, that's it. Thank you very much and good luck.